Thanks much. very much for having me. It's fantastic to be here. Uh, yeah, all the way from South Africa via Glasgow. That's where I was born, but I've lived in South Africa since I was nine. Uh, how are you doing? <laughs> Uh, so I'm looking forward to talking to you uh, for the next 20 minutes. You know, Oli mentioned EO, Entrepreneurial Organization. And it's interesting there because what we do is we try to tell people what to do. I find that entrepreneurs largely don't want to be told what to do. But what we do is we share experiences. So we'll often talk in what we call the Gestalt Language Protocol. We'll give an example of how we've experienced something and what happened in our business. And we hope that people are smart enough to draw conclusions uh, from, from that. And that's going to be a little bit about what uh, I'm going to do with you guys over the course of the next 20 minutes. I just want to make sure how on the same page we are. I am a dodgy South African. So uh, let's start with this picture here. Uh, what is that? Cow? Anyone else? You, a man? A what? A map? You know those questions that you say, guys, don't worry, there are no wrong answers. Yeah, uh, this is all wrong answers, okay? Except for that guy there. Okay. Okay. A witch a flying in for, okay, so uh, there's the witch's head, she's on this thing, that's her thing, there's the peacock, can you see it? Now this man is sexually frustrated, okay, what he's doing is he's letting you know that he's not had action in a week, and this is a bit of a problem. No, the right answer is in fact that this is a picture of a cow. Uh, who can see the cow? Right? Good. For the rest of you, let's make this a wee bit easier, I'm going to bring it into focus a bit here. What you have here is you have the ear, you have the jaw, that's its nose, it's its eyes, its ear, its head thing. Can you guys see the cow now? Yeah. Right, who can't see the cow? Yeah. <laughs> Who's lying? <laughs> okay. okay, just to make it a little bit easier, boom, there we go. Can everyone, can everyone see the cow? Good, okay. Now here's the challenge for me, is can you, can you still see the cow? Yeah. Right, so here's your problem. The problem we have in business is being able to unsee the cow. Five minutes ago, we lived in a world where nobody knew what that was, one guy. Now we live in a world that if I show you this picture a year from now, because that guy invariably saw it a year ago, you can never not see that this is a picture of a cow, right? You, no, no, he's just amazing, he's special. No, he did have sex yesterday, right? That's how we know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With himself, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Really, really, dude, I've never been in a hotel room that I haven't either, so <laughs> don't stress. Right, so... so <laughs> You know, if hotels were really about customer service, there would be tissues next to the bed. Anyway, that got this digressing quickly. So, so here's, here's what happens with entrepreneurs, is we start out, and when we start our businesses, we see, we see things, and we have a very, very, we have perspective. But as we gain experience, the one thing we lose, inversely proportional to experience, is perspective. We lose our ability to unsee the cow. And, and that's a critical problem, because we can't see the world, what it was like, when we set out to solve the problem in the first place. Let me explain to you. I'm a commuter, and I want to tell you a tale of two cities. I live on Monday to Thursday in Johannesburg here, and then on Thursday to Sunday, I live in Cape Town down here. I actually live just a little bit out of the shot of this, this photograph. Right, I, I know, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a shit way to live, really. Uh, and, and here's the thing. <clears throat> When you're traveling in you know, South Africa, a lot of people say, oh, South Africa, oh, you know, you're not scared of criminals. And, you know, we say to people, no, we're not. But the truth is, yes, <clears throat> we actually are. Now, I have a young family, and I was quite nervous when I started commuting about leaving my family and my kids uh, away when I, was, uh, when I was traveling. But luckily, the way the house is built is we have kind of a basement area. Then we have uh, like playrooms and stuff. Then the upstairs middle mezzanine is the lounge and the kitchen and things. And then upstairs is where all the sleeping areas were. And I was thinking if we could put a, 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 some sort of way of blocking off the upstairs area, if a burglar did get into our house, uh, then it's okay because it could take the TVs and, and the, the stereo and stuff like that, but they would leave my family when they're sleeping. <clears throat> so I found this company, a South African company called Trellidor, and I said to them, hey man, are you able to come and make my family safe while, you, while they're sleeping? And the guy said, sir, that's what we do. You know, this is our business. No problem at all. He gives me a quotation. It's about 5,000 rand. That's uh, about 250 pounds. And uh, he says to me, cool, okay, he's going to come and he's going to build this gate. I said, cool, that's fantastic. Uh, sure enough, I get an SMS about three weeks later. It says, Mr. Mulholland, just letting you know we're installing your gate. You know, your safe night sleeping begin today. I was like, oh, bloody hell, that's brilliant. Now, I think the internet makes us complain a bit much, and I don't want to be that whiny guy. But I will say that when I got home that night, there was, the gate was not perfect, okay? <laughs> I'm thinking that if the criminal, man, we live in a housing estate, so I'm thinking that if the criminal managed to get past 
the security guard at the gate station or over the electrified fence, then managed to dodge the security guards that patrol with dogs, got into my garden in which I have a boxer built like a brick shit house, laser beams everywhere that you have to go past like Catherine Eaton Jones. This is actually how we live. Through the downstairs treaded door we have, bypassing the alarm system like a sneaky ninja, right? He's not gonna get to the top of the stairs and then be like, ah. Oh. <laughs> well done, Mo. <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah. And then go and get our neighbors. No, bullshit. He's going to use it like a ladder <laughs> and have his way with me while I'm sleeping. Now I'll try anything once, but on my own terms. So I take this photograph. I take this photograph and I send it to the guy from Teledor that sold it to me with a very simple subject line. You may be familiar with it. It's W T F exclamation mark question mark. By the way, that thing there is called an interrobang. Now, I don't, I, the one thing that confuses me is I'm never sure which one is supposed to be first. Is it supposed to be like WTF? Or is it more like WTF? <laughs> <laughs> Whichever one it is, I clearly got it wrong. Because all I got back from the guy was a simple mail that said, lol, smiley face. <laughs> So I phoned him up, I said, dude, what do you mean lol, smiley face? What is this? He's on your photo, it was so funny. I said, wasn't it? <laughs> but what is it? He said, it's the gate you ordered. I said, but I didn't order a gate. He said, yes, you did. I said, no, 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 I didn't order a gate. I ordered, can you keep my family safe while they're sleeping? Your solution to what I ordered was to provide me with a gate. My family is not safe, you failed. He said, sir, I think you're being unreasonable. I said, no, I'm not being unreasonable at all. You put a gate in the middle of my house that someone can climb over. This is not helpful. I don't know what he wanted me to do, like listen for the gate and then shoot the guy when, when, you know, when he's up. So anyway, he said, no, 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 and they charged me an extra 3,000 rands, 150 pounds to come and build a wedge at the top. A funny aside to the story is I was once speaking at an insurance conference and the broker for the CEO of the company was in the room and I got a phone call the next day, Mr. Mulholland, I'm so embarrassed about what happened, <laughs> really, really, really sorry. And um, I said, no, no, that's fine, thanks so much for the phone call. And he said, so will you um, stop telling the story? I was like, dude, no way, it's a great story. <laughs> but I'll tell them you phoned. So he says hi. Anyway, <laughs> here, here's what happened here. And this is, this, is the, this is kind of the beginning of my thinking. Is what happened, and I think this happens to entrepreneurs everywhere, is that this gate, the idea is called a slam lock gate. When Trelador was started, the idea was if you were running away from a criminal and you wanted to run into your house, what you could do is you could shut this gate quickly and it immediately slammed and locked. The original television campaign was a lady running through a house getting chased with somebody through a garden. I mean, really, it's a rad place to live, honestly. <laughs> and then they slammed the door shut and they were locked. But what happens as entrepreneurs is we fall in love with the solution when what we really want to do is rekindle our love for the problem. Right? We become very, very caught up in the solution space and not, not caught up enough in the problem space. And I think that's where we fall short. So I want to explain this to you using a, a, a graph, right? I started my business, Missing Link, uh, when I was 22, graph, graph, I don't know. When I was 22 years old, I'm now 41. And we started off and it was a presentation business. I used to be a roadie, I'll talk about that a bit later. And then I started doing what these guys do for a living as well. And I would work on the staging aspect of conferences. Now these two guys, they look at them. And I, I, apparently I was told I'm allowed to say this. I'm just gonna tell you once, they fucking hate you, okay? They have to sit, listen to your terrible presentations every day of their life. They go home every night, they, their eyes are bleeding, and they go into their wife's arms in the fetal position, and they say they were so mean to me today. They were really, really bad at PowerPoint. And I thought, <laughs> I can start a business that fixes that. So I set out trying to build a presentation company. That was a problem for me. I realized it didn't matter, and we'll get to this later, but I realized that there had to be a better way. So at the beginning, I had to convince the world that there was a better way to do things. I was 22 years old and I was speaking to bankers. And I, I had to, but eventually I started getting traction. It started becoming a bit less effort. And, and I knew that I was trying to solve the problem. At those days, a good presentation, a lot of presentations were using overhead transparencies or just really, really bad PowerPoint. All of a sudden we won like a couple of quick wins, a couple of good wins, and we started getting traction. And we started cementing what a product was like. And we went into phase two of our business. Phase two of our business was solution refinement. Here we started refining the solutions of the business we had. Now this is very important because this is where we started making money. Because the idea is if you can leverage an economy of scale, if you can start making this deploy quicker, better, cheaper, if you can work better around your solution, then you're able to make money faster. 
This was huge for us. And for the next few years, this is the area we focused on. How do I scale my business? How do I get more products to more clients faster, better, cheaper? And by doing that, we started making a lot more cash. This is almost where all entrepreneurial businesses are if they're older than two or three or four years old. And the problem was things were absolutely amazing until about 2010, 2011, when we reached here and it started being an effort again. And I couldn't understand why, because we were still doing the same thing. We were still, it was still working. We were still solving the exact same problem. And then the penny dropped. That the problem was that I was still solving the wrong problem. You see, now all of a sudden, every one of you guys has a smartphone in your pocket that can make presentations better than we were making back in 1997. My son, my 13-year-old, can edit videos on his phone or his iPad. This is a product that we sell uh, as a specialized product, animation, video, all these things. And um, I realized that I was caught, I was a cure for no disease. I was solving a problem that existed in 1997. No, what I needed to do is start solving new problems. If you can start solving new problems, that's where you win. And I had to evolve our business to a point where we're solving a 2010 problem, not continuing to solve a 1997 one. The bad news was in order to do that, I had to be willing to sacrifice some of our previous products down to the great gods of progress. So some of the things that made me the most money, we completely commoditized, gave away almost for free, shared the IP, and tried to build a better business out of that. All of a sudden, we were in a small little climb again, but when we got out of that, we had a completely evolved business. Now, I believe that this is a fundamental problem that entrepreneurs face all the time, is that we simply get so caught up in our own world that we're unable to unsee the cow. We're unable to go back and say, is the problem that we're solving still as relevant as it was when we did it in the first place? And we start believing the value of the solution that we're providing. And I think there's a, there's a time in every entrepreneurial business where you need to be willing to critically look at that. This changed my business so much that I ended up writing a book on the topic, a book that actually Ollie's name is on the front cover. And uh, the book is called Legacide. It's why legacy thinking is the silent killer of innovation. You know, when we started uh, 21 Tanks, our innovation business, I wanted to be like an IDEO, create all these cool new products, big new things for businesses. I was super excited. But it turns out that what I thought innovation was wasn't, wasn't exactly uh, what it ended up being. There's a quote by George Bernard Shaw, Shaw. He says, some look at things that are and ask why. I dream of things that never are, were and ask why not. Now, this is prevailing wisdom for innovation. This is what we think innovation is. Let's make something that doesn't exist. But you know what? If you're brand, brand, brand new, then that's, that's innovation for you. But for the rest of us, innovation does not happen when you start doing something new. Innovation happens when you stop doing something old. And that's the, that's the mindset we need to get you into. We need to have you looking at your businesses critically for legacies. Let me give you an example. I want you to imagine that you go to your house right now and everybody still owns some CDs somewhere. Right, cool. I want you to go and in your mind's eye, I want you to grab for me uh, some CDs. They're not going to be your best. They're not going to be your worst. Just kind of middle of the road CDs. Can everyone picture what CD they've got? Right? Roughly how many songs are on that CD? 12. 12? Happy with that as a number? How many of those songs are amazing? One. One, two. Cool. How many of those songs are pretty good? Six. Six? Cool. And how many are shit you never listened to? The rest, right? Okay. So let me just, con just confirm this. On the way home, uh, you're on your way out, and your partner says, you please do me a favor, pop into Sainsbury's and get me some bananas. Do you walk in and say, hi there, I'd like to have a dozen bananas, please. May I have three that are really delicious, uh, a further five that are edible, and then the rest I'll just put a shit that'll poison my family. <laughs> it's completely absurd. And yet that's how we bought music, because that's how music was served. Now, I don't want to talk about us here, because I think that's the easy one. We had to buy it because we wanted the one or two good songs. And clearly, we valued the few good songs that we had at the equal to the 10 pounds or whatever it cost to buy it. What confuses me more, though, is why are bands continuing to make albums? Why are bands still making 12 song bodies of work? Why are they doing that? That's not how we buy music anymore. It's not how it's, what is it? But they're still going out there creating it. They're creating shit music that nobody wants because they feel they need to. So I started looking at it. Well, it turns out it's got nothing to do with the size of the disc. You can fit more than 12 songs onto a compact disc, right? So it had nothing to do with that. So I looked back for a legacy, and I found that there was a disc-based technology that came earlier than CDs that did have a physical limitation on it. What was that? Vinyl. 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 Right. So we had the vinyl. Do you remember you had six songs etched onto one song side? And then you flip it over, you have six songs carved onto the other side. Right? So there's a physical limitation here. 
So I thought, cool, so now I understand why there are roughly 12 songs on a CD. Now, when vinyl was, was created, there were two critical constraints at that time. The one was the cost of production, and the other was the cost of distribution. This cost quite a bit of money to make. A band would have to get onto an airplane, fly halfway around the world, maybe to Motown, uh, uh, sit there, book a production a facility, a producer, work with those guys, spend a long period of time creating an album. Then that had to be etched into vinyl, packaged, it had to be marketed, and it had to be distributed the world over. If you were going to do that, you wanted to create an economy of scale. So you wanted to get as many songs as you possibly could on that disc and sell it for its maximum. Therefore, 12 songs. So now I'm thinking, well, damn, why don't we make it 14, 15, 16 songs and sell it for more? Well, it turns out we weren't completely able to decide on what size this would be. You see, this had a predecessor as well. The predecessor of this was a gramophone. Now, they're not exactly the same size disc, but close as damn it. So I started looking about why gramophones were invented. Well, it turns out gramophones were not invented for music. It was only 10 to 15 years later that we started using gramophones for music. No, no, uh, it was a German toy company uh, in the United States that started using nursery rhymes. Turns out that the gramophone was originally invented by laboratory technicians who needed audible feedback for studies that they were doing in the late 1800s. So, or 1900, so 1800s. So, so what happened is that we have these guys here creating these discs with the, they gave audible sound, but they needed to be able to hear the test results. So they had to build this big badass horn to amplify the findings. Now they had to counterbalance the horn with this big block thing, and then they had a bit of space left between the disc and the horn, and that dictated the size of the medium we're able to use. So let's consider where we are in the world today. We live in a world where if I want to buy music, and let's say I don't have even, even if I want to buy it and not just stream it through a subscription service, this is my favorite band here, it's a band called Rise Against, I can simply buy one song, one time, I don't have to buy anything like that. And yet this band is still creating 12 song bodies of work trying to counterbalance a horn that has not existed in 120 years. <laughs> right, that is legacide. There is no, and people say to me, oh no, it's about creating bodies of work that are stories and narratives. Bullshit. Every now and then some of you are doing it, the rest of you are just making uh, albums like this because that's how long albums are supposed to be. 12, 13 songs. It's the same with business books. Business books, the legacy in a business book is based on, uh, you know, a normal bit of work of fiction has a story arc and there's the amount of time and space that, that it takes to tell that story. So if you see a business book in a shop, and you think, oh, it's about the same size as a novel. Now this is amazing to me, because I want to write a book like, don't you hate it when you, do any of you ever read business books? And you get the joke. You get the joke of the business book after the first two chapters. But the guy spreads that joke out <laughs> for 300 pages. You already know the punchline, but he just had to tell you, and you can hear where the writer got bored and the publisher took over. <laughs> But there's this legacy, because the legacy is that a book is that thick. Now that doesn't exist anymore. I read books on my Kindle. Books are not thick anymore. The burden of brevity when you write a book should fall on the writer and not the reader. Get your point across in a shorter period of time and leave. Because your time is more important than the five pounds you save on a book. It's not about me saying, well, for 10 pounds, I've got to give you a lot of value. No, for 10 pounds, I've got to give you as much value I can as in shorter space of time as humanly possible. But these legacies are everywhere. And I think that's the number one point that I want to get across today, is I need you to critically look at your businesses. Look at the problems you're solving and ask if they are still as relevant today as they were when you started. Have you inherited legacies as you go across? This is specifically important when you teach and induct new staff. We do a lot of this stuff. I, I don't know if you call it induction here or orientation. Is that the term? So these big companies will hire you to create an induction program. And it's amazing to me that they're going to hire these critically genius thinkers from other organizations, bring them into their company, and then say, right, stop thinking like with all that clever shit we brought you in with, and start thinking like the way we want you to think here. It is absurd. We need to try and think about it in a different way. And that, for me, is legacy. So how do we stop this? Well, there's this great quote. You must have heard it before by Confucius. Do what you love, and you'll never work a day in your life. You heard it? Yeah. Oh, come on, man. That's, <laughs> that's a crock of shit, okay? That is completely rubbish. If I did what I loved for a living, I would be a motorcycle pizza delivery guy. <laughs> anytime I'm not on, I mean, I hope I'd be better than that guy. I'd be like that guy. But anytime I'm on my motor, anybody motorcycle here? Anyone who has a motorcycle here would rather be on their motorcycle right now, 
right? My life is moments that exist between times I'm on my bike. But we think that this is it. We get told this rubbish about, oh, do what you love. Fall in love with what you do, guys. Come on. No, that's not the entrepreneurial way. Entrepreneurs aren't like that. Entrepreneurs fall in hate. We find things that piss us off and we fix them. <laughs> we're walking along the road one day and we're like, oh, <laughs> that shit. I could make a business that fixes that. And that's the key, is you have to find things that you fall in hate with. You gotta find things that frustrate you. That's where opportunity exists. If you love anything, it's because it works well for you. If it works well, it's fixed. There is no problem there, right? You can replicate, but it's not a great business model. If you can find something that fundamentally you hate, there's a market because there's other people that hate it too. That was me. As mentioned, I was like these guys in the back here. I used to tour uh, with several bands. So I toured with Bon Jovi, uh, Iron Maiden. I was uh, uh, the youngest ever uh, lighting designer to design the moving lights for an Iron Maiden world tour. Any of you guys do that? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I toured with Phil Collins, uh, Whitney Houston, and um, Cliff Richard, funny enough. It was quite funny because my mum came to that gig and she came up to me and said, Oh, Richard, can you introduce me to Cliff? I said, Mum, that's. It's really weird and inappropriate. And she says, oh, don't be silly. He's on my list. <laughs> now, I don't know if you know what a list is. <laughs> but I said, mom, now I'm definitely not introducing you. And I said, but you know, mom, and also, dad is right there. But my dad was like, you know, son, if he's on the list, he's on the list. <laughs> I don't know who my dad wanted to tap, but never mind. Anyway, I didn't introduce my mom. The other thing, I used to tour all these bands. The problem in South Africa, unlike here, is in South Africa, people would never go to concerts when the weather was bad. So in winter, we had no concerts whatsoever. I'm from Glasgow. If we didn't go to concerts when the weather was bad, <laughs> right? Yeah? So, so this was very weird for me. So I went to my boss and I said, we've got, at the time we were the second largest staging company on the planet in terms of gear based out of Johannesburg. And I said, we've got all this gear, but we're not busy in winter. We have to change this. And I identified two markets. Market number one was the corporate market, or, or the, and market number two was the rave market. Now, I went to work at a rave once. I don't take drugs, I don't smoke, and I don't drink. I'm standing in front of this, this thing, operating lights, and about three in the morning, a guy came up, started dancing, took out a toothbrush, and brushed his teeth at me for two hours. <laughs> Cleanest teeth you have ever seen in your life. But I thought, nah, this is too crazy for me. Let me go to corporates. So I went, and I would go to these CEOs, and I'd say, you know, I did the lighting for Iron Maiden, and I want to turn you into a rock star. Your conferences are horrific. Your staff are bored. They want something better. I can give that to you. And they were like, yes, do it. And I don't know if you've ever been to a big corporate conference, but they always start the same way. And the CEO comes out the back of the room, like the lighting fades down, the music starts, and he's running through high-fiving people and everyone <laughs> batshit crazy. And women are spontaneously orgasming at the beginning. And he's, he's like ripping on his pants and he's saying, Barclays, back, but I never live ah! They are screaming, they're amazing. And he's like, thank you, thank you, welcome. And the video finishes with a big motivational message and it's fantastic. He says, all right, thank you. You. Right, now, um, <laughs> only through a production chain, manufacturing, and the people in the front are looking at me like, like, there's actually a word for it, it's spelled D-A-F-U-K, like F-U-Q, like, the fuck is going on here? Where's the other guy? So this is what I used to do. I used to sit at the back, creating these light shows until I realized I was solving the wrong problem. I loved lighting, lighting was amazing. You could do amazing things with it. But presentations were crap. And I thought, that's what I need to do. So at 22, I set out to build a presentation company. We're now the fourth largest, so that's what we do in the world. We work all over the world with many, many big companies. Because there's a problem here. I fell in hate with bad presentations. This, by the way, is a real slide. You can find it in the Wall Street Journal. Apparently, somewhere in the slide exists the solution to the trouble in the Middle East. <laughs> I mean, how's that working out for us, right? <laughs> Bad PowerPoint. I can see you're not completely convinced, so maybe a last convincer on falling in hate with something. What are these? Jeans, jeans right? What are on those? Buttons. buttons. Who put buttons on jeans? Le Levi's. Levi's. Who had Levi's? Uh -huh. Mrs. Levi. Had to be a woman. A woman at Levi's put buttons on jeans based on her hatred of? Penises. <laughs> right. <laughs> Based on her hatred of men, okay? Because women are jealous that we can pee so easily. 
And I used to work in concerts, and there's always the guys who can just go anywhere to the port and there's always that queue of ladies who are just pretending to dance, but you can see. And they're like, oh, you bastards, it's too easy for you. So they put buttons on jeans. And now a guy will walk in, they're like, all right, <coughs> oh, all right. <coughs> it's so easy. Remember how easy that was? Now it's, <laughs> and that's actually fine when you're on the way out, the way back. Trying to button it up again, it's bloody impossible. You're sitting there like this, you know, you eventually have to take your pants down to try and undo it again. The guy next to you is like, dude, we just met, you know, he's, he's doing the suck back and moving to the next urinal. This is what they've done to us. In fact, speaking of, sorry, so speaking of just, while, and please, ladies, you don't have to listen to this, but this is for the guys. Nick, are you Nick? Yes. Right, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I want to apologize in advance for where this is going. See what Nick is wearing there? He's wearing chinos. <laughs> guys, please. And, and ladies, again, you don't have to listen to this big go on Twitter or something. Guys, this is for you. This is, public, this is, this is a bonus, right? <laughs> your willy knows when you're wearing beige pants. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Inside every penis in this room is a ninja drip. <laughs> <laughs> it is a drip of such resilience. You can shake till you're blue in the face. And you'll be shaking. It's inside like, stand in. It's like, oh, come on. Oh, oh, oh. And then finally, when you get it, it's just like, oh, I got it all. It says, ha, 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 release. Boom. On your pants. Like this. Every single guy in this room has been ninja drugged at some time in his life. How you know what has happened to us? Because we only have one excuse. If a guy walks out of the toilet pretending the hand dryer didn't work, oh, look at this. <laughs> You know he's been ninja dripped. That's why I hate beige pants. Anyway, my point is this. You have to find things you fall in hate with. If you can fall in hate with legacy thinking, you'll be able to change the way that your mind works around innovating. The final quote I want to share with you in this thing is by a futurist by the name of Alvin Tovler. He says this, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn unlearn and relearn. That is my challenge to you today. Be willing to learn, unlearn and relearn what you know because certainty is your ego moving in for the kill. Ladies and gentlemen, you get that right, you'll be able to unsee the cow. Thank you so much for having me in Bristol. Cheers.